Hello and welcome to this leader series called The Human Side, where we tackle insanely large topics and squeeze them into 10 minute sprints. Today we're going to introduce the modern day organizational psychology, meaning we'll largely ignore the influences of the Greek greats, such as Socrates and Aristotle, and even the Chinese legend of Confucius. Instead, turning our focus on the developments in this field dating back to the 20th century around the beginning of the 1900s and then moving towards the present day thinking. We're going to tackle topics. First, we need to align on the term organizational psychology as the practice has different names and meanings globally. First emerging as industrial psychology prior to the beginning of the 20th century, the practice is now known as work psychology in Europe and in the UK. However, it was previously called occupational psychology back in the UK in the early 1900s. Organizational psychology has emerged following broader trends in social sciences, which has less focus on the individual. In America, there's a term organizational behavior, which is a label applied to the area of human relations. Whichever your preferred terminology, our aim in this sprint is to provide an overview of how psychology is being applied to study individuals at work. So, to the topics that we will briefly introduce to you today. We're going to start by looking at Taylor, and then we're going to talk about this term fitting the job to the man versus fitting the man to the job. We'll look at the infamous Hawthorne studies, We'll touch on leadership versus management, working in groups, employee well-being, and employee motivation and job satisfaction. So we start our journey with F.W. Taylor and his work with process management in manufacturing, which was later coined scientific management. This work focused on improving workflows and thereby productivity, largely through improved efficiency of the worker. His principles were largely based around the belief that the factory workers were incapable of logical thought themselves and needed specific instructions to follow, which had to be determined and designed by management. Nice, right? He died in 1915, and the influence of his theories can still be seen in organizations today. But in the 1920s, scientific management was being challenged with opposing or complementary ideas. His main book, Principles of Scientific Management has been recognized, however, as one of the leading management books in our past century. During this period, psychologists started to look at two other elements, fitting the job to the man and fitting the man to the job. Much of the early work in these two approaches occurred as a response to the two world wars, one and two, and the adverse consequences from working long hours. Screen tests were developed to assess the individual's personality and their ability to do the job. And the extensive use of aircraft in World War II saw studies in the design of cockpits as a means of optimizing the fit as well as the workings for the pilots. So we can summarize therefore by saying that both fitting the man to the job and fitting the job to the man are concerned with the relationships between individuals and their job. And we can still see many aspects of these theories in a workforce across the world today. Enter the importance of human relations and the famous research known as the Hawthorne Studies. A fascinating series of tests conducted in the late 1920s spanning into the early 1930s. These tests were conducted with different groups of workers at the Western Electric Factory in Hawthorne, Chicago. And the first experiment assessed the use of different lighting levels to gauge the effect on the worker's productivity. The outcome was the realization that factors other than illumination were determining the productivity level. The second test was conducted with a small group of female workers on relay assembly. Various changes were made to the women's working conditions during the study, and changes such as the length of the working day, the working week, length of the timing of their rest breaks, etc. The result was improved productivity, 
although it was later determined that additional factors had contributed to the result, things such as the interest shown by those people conducting the test in the women themselves. Next was the bank wiring room study, which revealed that working in teams and collaboration across the team could also drive productivity improvements. And then lastly, a counselling program where all employees were interviewed to monitor the impact of seeking their input and the change to productivity. The birth of the human relations movement led to many studies in a broad range of different areas of psychology. One such area which continues to receive much review is that of leadership and its benefits that it has over management. We merely list here a number of the key areas of focus to provide you with an insight to the depth of these studies, and we'll delve deeper into these topics in other sprints. The field of experts weighing in with their theories is so extensive, from Carlyle, Lewis, Likert, Fiedler, Fayol, Cotter, Bass, House, Mitchell, it just goes on, Gardner, Hickman, Mumford, Percy, Blanchard, Salovey, Mayer, and Goldman, just to name a handful. The five areas of leadership listed here in turn have multiple subsets, each proposing to have a different answer somewhat to what makes the perfect leader. Trait theory, for instance, focuses on identifying different personality traits and characteristics that are linked to successful leadership across a variety of situations. Behavioural leadership looks at the various styles of the leader, while situational leadership stresses the need for a leader to be able to adapt to any given situation and using a variety of styles. And to the topic of working in groups. Additional studies have branched into this field of employee dynamics whilst working in teams or groups. The interesting findings which have resulted from the studies identified a number of processes which often impeded the success of the working groups. These can be listed as personality factors such as shyness, egocentricity, social conformity, communication skills, domination by a particular individual, status, gender, and the effect of hierarchies. Two further elements were identified as impacting group decisions and potential. The first is called risky shift or group polarization, which is essentially the tendency of the work group to make more extreme decisions. And the second is known as groupthink which is exhibited by the work groups who try to minimise conflict and reach a consensus without critically testing, analysing or evaluating ideas during the group decision making process. Additionally, we also have Tuckman's team development and Belbin's team roles, which are two well-known theories used extensively worldwide in supporting teams to overcome these shortcomings and to reach their potential. Moving now on to the second last topic, employee well-being, which has been one derivative coming out of the human relations field, with ongoing studies exploring the correlation between workplaces, employee emotions and productivity. The effect of stress on workers through the task, the environment, interpersonal relationships, job security, shift work, workplace violence, the list is quite long. These are all factors which have had a bearing on this broad field of study. And we tend to study emotions through three main areas, physiological, neurological, and cognitive. However, it really seems that even with all of these studies, society has been unable to address workplace stress. And today we see mental illness as one outcome which is at an all time high. One promising and relatively new study in this field is on positive psychology, as defined by its founder Seligman as the scientific study of positive human functioning and flourishing on multiple levels that include biological, personal, relational, institutional, cultural and global dimensions of life. Or you could just say it simply in other words, 
the study of what makes life worth living. And finally, to the topic of employee motivation and job satisfaction. Contrary to the approach popularized by Taylor, the experiments of Blake, Mayo, Lewin, and Likert in 1963 popularized the belief that once workers are provided opportunities to participate in the management process, this leads to positive gains for the organization's effectiveness and the morale of the employees, which naturally, in turn, has an impact on job satisfaction. Like all of the other areas covered so far, there's been extensive research in this field, from Taylor through Mayo, Maslow, Herzberg, to others such as McGregor, Adams, McClellan, and recently Rock, and even Dan Pink. Neuroscience today is providing us with confirmation of many previously held beliefs, whilst also educating us on many other realizations of how the human brains are hardwired and respond in given situations. It's another highly fascinating field and I'm really sure there's much more to come in the years ahead. Well, as we're sure you can see from this brief introduction to organizational psychology, the topics and related studies which have occupied the minds of expert psychologists for well over a century will continue at pace with the advent of neuroscience discoveries. For you, the leader, whether young or experienced, it's an area which you need to stay abreast of and look for ways to incorporate the findings into your practices. From us, we hope that you've enjoyed this first sprint, and if you want to explore deeper, be sure to check out our show notes for all of the links covered for these topics. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, so that we can continue the journey together exploring the human side.